I suppose I should get started. So I, uh, I uh, did not include a biography here, but I will, I will say it in words and then I will add some slides later and we're including all my uh, um, contact information. So my name is, uh, is Mary Bishai. I'm a senior physicist at Brookhaven National Lab. So I'm Katevi's uh, <laughs> colleague and this is how I got involved with ASB. Um, I'm originally uh, from Egypt. Um, and I grew up uh, between Egypt and Western Africa. My parents were in, were, worked as engineers in Nigeria when I was a little girl. And then my father for uh, 15 years worked at the African Development Bank. And he, uh, when I told him I was going into physics, not engineering, which is what is expected, <laughs> uh, he, you know, he, he always makes fun of me. He used to make fun of me. Um, and uh, because he considered that what I was doing was kind of useless, you know, it's not feeding people. Uh, so, so it's interesting to see everybody come here. So basically what happened is that I uh, started out at the American University in Cairo uh, as an undergraduate. I came to the U.S. as an exchange student and I was, I ended up at the University of Colorado Boulder where I finished my bachelor's in physics. And so primary reason I came to the US is I wanted to do physics and I wanted to do particle physics. And there was not much opportunity, of course, when I was in Egypt. And then uh, I went, I did my PhD at Purdue University in Indiana. And after that, um, I was a postdoctoral fellow at Fermi National Lab. And then I got a staff position at Brookhaven Lab. And all of this time, uh, I've been working in different aspects of particle physics. So I was uh, working on collider physics and uh, in particular study of heavy flavor physics when I was a graduate student at, uh, uh, at an electron positive and collider called CSER up at Cornell University. And then I worked on um, studies of B quark production at the CDF detector, which was at the Tevatron, a proton antiproton 2 TeV collider. And then I, uh, uh, at that time, around the time I was starting to look for staff positions, it was around 2003, 2004. Um, and as you will see from my little history of neutrinos, that was when uh, neutrino uh, and the study of neutrinos was, was pushing itself to the forefront as one of the next big frontiers in particle physics. And luckily, after applying for three jobs at Brookhaven, I think two of them on Atlas, <laughs> I was actually offered a job on a neutrino experiment. And so I, I switched from collider physics to neutrino physics. And that's what I've been doing for the last uh, uh, 15 years or so. So let me, uh, I think one of the best ways to learn about physics is actually to examine the history and through the history to learn how the concepts uh, that we take for granted today came into being. Now, um, I do speak English a little fast. <laughs> I picked up the East Coast American uh, English. Uh, so um, do please interrupt if I'm going too quickly. And I, will, I, will, I, I hope I'll have plenty of opportunities for you to interact. So let's get started. So, a lot of you are probably here because of maybe something you saw on YouTube or, or, or heard on the internet, but your interest in science, I, I got interested through magazine articles and, you know, the few science shows on TVs that we had. And so it's always, it, you know, people might get attracted to the concept of popular culture. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd throw out, uh, start with slides on how neutrinos uh, have featured in popular culture and then tell you what they are. <laughs> so in the 1960s, uh, John Updike, who was a very famous American author and man of letters, uh, wrote a poem dedicated to neutrinos. This is how, how fascinating they were that uh, some of the lead uh, American literary giants were paying attention. And he writes, neutrinos, they are very small. They have no charge and have no mass and do not interact at all. The earth is just a silly ball to them through which they simply pass like dust mates down a drafty hall or photons through a sheet of glass. They snub the most exquisite gas, ignore the most substantial wall. Now, most of this is true. Neutrinos are small. They are elementary particles. So they have no charge. 
it's not true that they have no maths. We will learn that that was one of the key breakthroughs of the 21st century really is establishing that neutrinos have math. And it's not true that they do not interact at all, although their interactions are very weak. So the next piece of, uh, you know, just moving into more recent popular culture. So uh, NASA declared, this is from 2011, there was a, a film, movie called 2012 <laughs> that came out, I believe it came out uh, in 2011. And NASA declared it uh, to be the, the it put it on their silly sci-fi film list. So, uh, you know, NASA experts voted 2012, that's the movie, the most scientifically flawed and absurd science fiction film ever made. <laughs> uh, so in the film, basically what happens is that neutrinos emitted by the uh, fusion processes in the sun and neutrinos are weakly interacting. You now know about the four particle, four forces of particle physics. Neutrinos are the only ones that are purely weakly interacting. Suddenly uh, convert to strongly interacting particle and being given their abundance, they will actually kind of destroy the earth. So that, that was the premise of the film. So it was kind of really bad, but that's where neutrinos are in, in popular culture. So let's, let's now move on to the history and the conception of the neutrino. So, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, there was a lot of studies of, of, of radioactivity and trying to understand radioactivity and understanding the basic uh, structure of matter. And uh, what you know, the way physicists studied radioactivity is that they, were, they knew there were different types of radiation, right? And so um, you will hear, uh, we use gammas, for example, to donate high energy photons, but that was because when physicists, they realize, you know, some of the radiation is ionizing, some of it penetrates, some of it doesn't. So they were able, uh, through the interactions with the detectors, to determine that there were at least in radioactive decays three, time, three types of radioactivity that comes out. And because they were physicists and not very imaginative, they called them alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha, beta, gamma are uh, the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, like radiation A, radiation B, radiation C. Um, and so beta, we now know that alpha are uh, helium nuclei. So they, uh, uh, that's what alpha particles are. They tend to be highly ionizing, but they don't go very far. Beta radiation is what we now know to be an electron and gammas are photons. So those are, so now we know what the three particles are, but they didn't. So they were studying radioactive decays in which uh, beta uh, an electron is produced, and they knew that it was a single particle that came out. But when they looked at the energy spectrum of the particle, they found that it is continuous. Now, if we have one particle decaying into another particle that remains in the nucleus, the nucleus, you know, it, it's still intact. So one particle at rest decaying to another particle at rest, it emits uh, a particle that we detect the laws of energy conservation mean that the, the particle emitted, since both the, the initial and final state are at rest, the particle emitted should be monoenergetic. It should be just a different, be, the difference between the two energy states of the, the, the original nucleus and the daughter nucleus that was produced from the decay, right? So they knew there were nuclei decaying. Nucleus A becomes nucleus A prime and one particle comes out why is that particle have a continuous energy spectrum, which is what was observed? They do not see a monochromatic beam of, of energetic particles coming out. So this was, uh, even though they know it's only one type of particle coming out, and so this was mysterious. They didn't understand what was going on. And so there was a lot of debate about this. And so the so Wolfgang Pauli, um, he, he had a, a bit of inspiration as to why this could be shown. And, uh, you know, at that time, they were already starting to know the, the structure of the nucleus and that it, it, you know, there are protons in it. And he wrote a letter to physicists at a workshop in Tübingen, Germany. And this is a translation. It says, dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen, I've hit upon a desperate remedy to save the exchange theorem of statistics. 
and the law of conservation of energy. Namely, the possibility that there could exist in the nuclei electrically neutral particles that I wish to call neutrons. The mass of the neutrons should be of the same order of magnitude as the electron mass, and in any event, not larger than 0.1 or 10% uh, of a proton mass. The continuous beta spectrum would then become understandable by the assumption that in beta decay, a neutron is emitted in addition to the electron, such as the sum of the energies of the neutron and electron is constant. Great inspiration. They already knew that because uh, the weight of the daughter, uh, they already knew that the, uh, the mass of this particle is small because basically the parent and daughter nuclei are very similar in mass. Okay, so that's how they knew that there was a, the particle that's emitted, its mass could not exceed a certain amount of proton mass. And they knew there were protons, but they didn't know, I don't know about neutrons yet. So he, the end of the letter, he says, oh, I've got this great insight, energy, I've saved the laws of energy conservation. Unfortunately, I cannot appear in Tübingen personally, since I am indispensable here in Zurich because of a ball on the night of six, seven. A ball is, is a, an older term for a party where people dance and you know drink and everything. So he, he's going to a party. So, you know, great inspiration, great ideas, but I got better things to do. It's not true that physicists just hang out doing nothing but physics all day, obviously. All right. And then and and so that was the the idea that there is a neutral particle in the nucleus. Um, and that it is emitted in radioactive decays. So in 1932, uh, James Chadwick uh, actually discovered what we now call the neutron. And the, day, the way he did it, he was, he was looking at the decays of polonium, which produces alpha. We now know alpha is a helium nucleus. Alpha particles, the alpha particles would then hit a plate of beryllium and only the neutrons would come out of the beryllium. And so it's neutral. They knew it wasn't charged. You can put a, you put a Geiger counter there and you don't see anything. But if you put a piece of paraffin between the beryllium window and the Geiger counter, you will detect protons. If you take out that piece of paraffin, you don't, so there's a neutral particle and you can estimate from the time of flight, the time from which it travels from uh, the beryllium to the paraffin or to the Geiger counter. Um, you, can, you can do some of the timing there and they were able to determine that it is about uh, the same mass as the proton, right? So neutral particle coming out. Is there a question? Yeah, um, I just wanted to find out what happens, what happens between the neutrons and the par the, the, the that uh, layer of paraffin for it to produce protons on the other side. So paraffin, I think, is a, is a hydrocarbon. So there are protons in the hydrogen there. So it's actually the neutrons are uh, kicking out the protons in the hydrogen. That's what my understanding is. Oh. That, that's where the protons come in. Now paraffin is, is, is uh, it's a hydro, it's, it's made out of uh, oils. And so it's hydro, it's hydrogen rich in the hydrocarbon. So that's a good question. And actually, I am not sure, that's my guess. <laughs> so I always say, go and check my information, but I think that, that, but that, that is what is happening. The neutrons are interacting and uh, releasing the protons if, if, from the hydrogen, which is weakly bonded in this hydrocarbon. Okay. Okay. So, um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, polonium is named after Poland. Uh, which is where uh, the birthplace of Mary Curie was one of the elements that she discovered here, here and dear to my heart. Okay, so neutron is discovered. Um, it, it's amazing, you know, the, the precision with which it, it's always interesting to go back to the history and to look at the apparatus and the design of the experiments. Um, and because that uh, allows you to really understand how the instrumentation we use came along. So I, I only know a little bit about this experiment. I don't know in detail, but I think some of the other lecturers might be able to tell us more about this. All right, so the neutron, there's a neutral particle in the nucleus called the neutron, and uh, it is about the mass of the proton. And if we go back to Wolfgang Pauli's letter, they already knew that the neutral particle 
that was supposed to save the conservation of energy uh, is again from the different in masses between the, the, the two states, the initial and final state nucleus cannot be close to the mass of proton. They already knew it was less than 10% of the mass of proton. So this neutron cannot be the, the neutral particle of quality. So in 1933, so this is happening very quickly, you know, all, you know, the, another particle, another conference, this is the importance of conferences, right? Everybody exchanges all these ideas. Enrico Fermi said, well, it's not a neutron that's coming out in beta decay. It is a little neutron and the little neutron in Italian would be neutrino. And he named this mysterious particle at the time quite mysterious, uh, the little neutron, little neutral one, which is neutrino. Because Italian. So as I go forward, I'm going to be using a lot of symbols that some of you may or may not be familiar with. Again, I am keeping this very, very simple. Some of you are much more advanced than others. And as I move through the lectures, we'll move on to a little bit more advanced concept, but I'll start with very simple ones. So the uh, symbol for neutrino and antineutrino is the Greek nu. And uh, whenever, and of course, by now you know that we donate, we usually put a dash above a particle to indicate that it's the anti, uh, uh, anti particles, particularly in the case of the neutrino, since it's neutral. We use the symbol gamma for photons, uh, electrons, and the anti electrons are uh, positrons or E plus, electrons are E minus. And here is uh, specific when we're talking in uh, uh, about nuclear interactions, uh, we use the small p and the small n for proton and neutron. And, but we use the capital N when we wanna interchangeably talk about components in a nucleus, so nucleon. So capital N means both protons and neutrons, little n specifically means the neutron. And particle physics, we express mass in terms of energy equals mc squared. And so, in the, and the, we usually use electron volts. And so you'll, you'll see us interchangeably tell you that the Higgs particle is 125 giga electron volts, okay? Giga, a, the mass of the proton is almost a giga electron volt. So just put that, stick that in your mind. One giga electron volt is the mass of the proton. It's actually 936 mega electron volts, but within, uh, <laughs> Within a few percent, it's one giga electron volt. So that should be the standard, right? And uh, you know, this is this energy uh, somewhere on the web. It says it's the energy of a flying mosquito. I know you can convert it to joules and try and find out how anybody measured the energy of a flying mosquito. Now, following all of this, uh, at the same time, Fermi also built up his theory of weak interactions and beta decay. And uh, you, what we see over here are, you've seen this a lot already, or maybe you haven't, but uh, Feynman, and so that there were, you know, there are rules for calculating uh, the probability of interactions, including cross sections and so on. And so Feynman came up with the diagrams that you see here today. I think you can see my pointer. And these are called Feynman diagrams. These are calculational tools and so you can write down this diagram, it follows certain rules and then translate it, and I'm not a theorist, so I'm not gonna do that now, translate it into an actual formula that you can calculate, but it's much easier to visualize this way. So everywhere you see a vertex over here, there's an interaction strength. And if it's a weak interaction, so the weak interaction proceeds via exchange of what we call uh, the, the, the boson in charge. So let's imagine this is an electron and this is an anti-electron, a positron. There would be a photon here, okay? So that is the electromagnetic interaction. And the weak interaction in this particular case, the radioactive decay in neutron decays into a proton and the, the, and, uh, the uh, force carrier is a charged W boson. The weak interaction actually has two force carriers. Electromagnetic has a photon. The weak interaction has two force carrier. One is the W boson, which could be charged. And so of course there's a W minus and W plus. There's always a particle antiparticle pair or a, a neutral boson called the Z boson. So there are two force, two carriers for the weak force. And so the, the radioactive decay is the manifestation of weak interactions in neutron decays to a proton 
an electron and an antineutrino. Okay, that's what we have over here. Now, neutrinos and electrons are both in the lepton family, and so there are conservation laws that says if I start out with a hadron that is something with quarks in it, like a neutron and proton, I should only end up with, with uh, a hadron on this side. So this is a baryon. Sorry. A baryon, so this is baryon, and this is a baryon. There are three quarks and baryons. So baryon, it goes to baryon, and so I should have a lepton and an anti-lepton over here. Right? That's the law. So that I have zero lepton number on this side. You can, you can then also reverse this process. And so I can have a neutron interacting with a neutrino. If I move the neutrino from this side to this side, an antineutrino becomes a neutrino over here. So it's a baryon interacting with a lepton producing a proton plus electron. And of course, charge here is zero, charge here is zero. You can also have an interaction where you know, you're scattering, basically. So a neutron or a proton exchanges a Z particle with an incoming neutrino. What happens is an exchange of momentum. This is a neutral current interaction. So the Ws are charged, so we call that a charged current interaction. The current here refers to the weak current. And uh, if it exchanges a Z boson, that is the neutral current. And so you can have a scattering where there's a momentum exchange. So the, the momentum of the final states are different than the initial states, but what happens is you do not have a change in the particle. You just change it, the kinematics. So the neut neutrino remains a neutrino and it scatters off a neutron or proton, which remain a neutron or proton, whereas in this particular case, the neutrino interacts with a neutron to produce a proton and an electron. So now is my first exercise. So here is our neutron decay, which is the beta decay, right? Remember these are baryons. So baryon number one, baryon number one, if it's an antiparticle, it'd be baryon number minus one. And these are leptons, lepton number one, lepton number minus one, barium numbers conserved. So I can bring the antineutrino back and I can have a neutron interacting with a neutrino to produce a proton and electron. Remember this interaction? Now my exercise. If I have an anti-electron interacting with a proton, what do I get at the other side of this equation? I hear an answer, but it's very faint. Maybe in the chat. I can't see the chat window, though. Neutrino, <laughs> yeah. neutrino plus uh, anti-electron. Um, I have the neutrino over here. So you say neutrino plus oh, anti. No, no, not a neutrino, a neutron. OK. See what the answer is. Of course, you have the slide. You're right. It's a neutron plus an anti-electron. Excellent. Thank you very much. Keep this in mind. All right. So with this formula in mind, whereas an antineutrino interacts with a proton to give you a neutron and an anti-electron, we'll move to the next phase in neutrino physics, which is actually finding neutrinos. Um, and so the first attempt, we know that neutrinos are produced in radioactive decays. And so uh, Frederick Rhinus, who was a protege of Richard Feynman, who developed Feynman diagrams, and, uh, 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 and uh, electroweak uh, interaction theory. Um, he decided, he's an experimentalist, he's like, okay, well, you know, we have lots of radioactive decays when, <laughs> when we have nuclear fission and, you know, there'd be, so why, it, you know, why not go and, and put a detector near where we're, uh, we're blowing, you know, we're um, testing atomic bombs. This is the 1950s, atomic bomb tests were, uh, were happening everywhere and in, in uh, US, Europe. Um, and so um, they wanted to take advantage of that and to detect the neutrinos actually um, produced by uh, uh, a, uh, a bomb test. And so they, they started thinking about putting in a detector um, and 
what they were going to do is use one of these interactions, right? Either a neutrino, this is how I'm going to detect a neutrino. It will interact with a neutron and give me a proton and an electron, or it will interact with an antineutrino, will, produce, will interact with a, a proton and give me a neutron or an electron. These are the, the, this is how we are going to detect neutrinos. We already knew this happened because we know this happened. But they, they looked into this, they looked into the yield of neutrinos, they looked into, you know, how much shielding, because there's a huge amount of radioactivity that's produced, and I only want to detect a neutrino interaction, and they decided it's not really that feasible. They didn't have to do with the fact that they have to blow up a bomb to do it, that was happening. So they decided that the next best thing is that we were going to go and do this test at a nuclear reactor. And and what happens in your typical nuclear reactor is you have a, you, uh, you have a fast neutron that uh, uh, interacts with a uranium-235 nucleus, producing uranium-236, right? So that's an extra neutron. Their atomic mass goes up. But uranium-236 is unstable. It fissions into barium and krypton, and energy is released, okay, in the form of photons and heat, of course, that's what the photons are, gammas. Now, barium and krypton, these themselves are also unstable, and so they also, uh, 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 they, they also have a radioactive decay chain to even more, until finally you end up with a stable nucleus. Now, this is an illustration of uh, the, the process, the fission process, including the, the, the chain reactions and the fission products. And you can see it actually turns out there are almost 6,000 <laughs> uh, 6, uh, uh, um, sorry, 6,000 branches to this process, all of which are producing neutrinos. So some of these don't produce neutrinos, the initial fission does not produce neutrinos. So these are the particles produced at each stage in this chain reaction. There's a neutron, an electron, an antineutrino, and a photon. So you'll see that if we look at the antineutrino, it's emitted, say, in this part of the branch. It's emitted in the case of U239. It's emitted in uh, the case of plutonium, which is also part of the, this is plutonium 239. Um, and so you will see that there are many, many radioactive de uh, decays in this, uh, in this chain reaction that do produce neutrinos. Some don't. Fission does, usually doesn't, but it's the decay of the daughter nucleus that does. And so this process is understood nuclear physics-wise, and, uh, and a lot of the individual beta decays are understood. So we, now, we know there are neutrinos coming out. From the beta decay spectrum, we actually have an idea what the energy of the neutrinos coming out are and the number of neutrinos. And so the decision was, I can use this information. I know it's produced with the beta decays. I know the chain reactions. I know the, the list of isotopes that are produced and which ones are decaying to neutrinos. Why not use this as a known source of, of, of neutrinos and then try to detect the neutrinos from a nuclear reactor? So, Fred Rhinus and Clyde Cohen proposed to use the Hanford nuclear reactor and the new Savannah River nuclear reactor to find neutrinos. And they wrote to uh, Enrico Fermi, who had named neutrinos, and said, uh, you know, this is our idea. And he, he was, by that time, a very prominent physicist, of course, uh, having played a, a key role in the Manhattan projects and others. And he says, he read a letter and he said, I was very interested in your new plan for the detection of the neutrino. Clearly your new method should be much simpler to carry out and have the great advantage that the measurement can be repeated any number of times. I'd be interested in seeing your, uh, your scintillation counter and, uh, and basically Enrico Fermi gave them the blessing they needed. All right. So they actually, this is a picture of one of the first uh, neutrino detectors, and <laughs> you will see that actually uh, um, our current, we do have a lot of uh, neutrino uh, detect 
uh, experiments that are happening in a nuclear reactor, they look very similar. So the detection process is as follows, an, elect an antineutrino. So in, the, in beta decays, we go back again. Remember that what happens in, in uh, beta decay is you get an antineutrino because you get an electron here. And so we can't have any leptons on this. So we get a lepton, an anti-lepton, they balance out, barium number is conserved. And so this is an antineutrino. So if I want to detect my antineutrino, I use this process, antineutrino. Plus a proton gives me a neutron and a positron. Now the positron will annihilate almost instantaneously with electrons to produce photons. Positron carries away the energy of the neutrino, the initial antineutrino, and so do we have a good idea what that is. Um, and so these photons come at, at a particular energy range. The neutron, in this particular case, they fill the detector uh, with water with cadmium chloride in solution. And the reason they chose cadmium chloride is because this process produces not just the positrons, which annihilate with electrons to give you uh, photons, a flash of light. And, but the neutron can also be detected because it neutron, uh, the cadmium in solution, neutron plus cadmium 108, you change the atomic mass by one becomes uh, cadmium 109. In an excited state of cadmium 109, this de-excites and emits a photon with a known energy. So you have, and this has a known lifetime. So this process takes five microseconds is the typical lifetime. So what you can do is the neutrino interaction produces a neutron and a positron. And the reason you want to use these two interactions is that you really want to separate it out from the background. There are all kinds of cosmic rays that come into your detector that will interact. This is a scintillator detector. It will scintillate. You know, any energy deposited in the material will produce light. So if you if you were only looking for this, you would be overwhelmed by background. But if I'm looking for this photons in a particular energy range, because I know the initial positron energy, uh, it's a, the spectrum of beta decay. And if I knew, and I know exactly the spectrum of this photon and the lifetime. So this interaction happens instantaneously. This interaction and this photon emitted with a particular energy, uh, and this is probably a series of photons, but it, it's a known, uh, known spectrum of photons. And that lifetime is five microseconds. So these are very correlated signals. So the, what they did it is they surrounded this, uh, this detector filled with cadmium chloride in solution um, and uh, located 11 meters from the reactor center with photomultiplier tubes. Is everybody familiar with the photomultiplier tube? It detects photons using the photoelectrical effect. It's uh, maybe if you I, can summarize in a few yeah. I will assume that you are, but we can talk about it a little later. But they, it detects light, so the interaction produces these two flashes of light. And so, uh, what happens is that they were able to turn on and off these reactors, and so they will turn it off, they will still get flashes of light from cosmic ray background interacting in this insulator material they will turn it on and they will see an increase in these coincident flashes of lights with this characteristic time and the characteristic energy. Of so, this. Yeah, sorry, uh, we, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get what you said. What, what exactly are they turning on? Are they turning on the photo multiplier detector or the scintillator? No, they are turning on the reactor. This is sitting okay. next to a nuclear reactor. Okay. Right, okay. So, I mean, reactors turn on and off to refuel to, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 it, and so they're, they were taking advantage of, the, in these days, there was still a lot of more reactor downtime as they do nuclear reactors. And so they keep the detector on, but only the reactor goes down, right? So if you are getting interactions from cosmic rays or from uh, uh, charged particles uh, in cosmic rays in your detector, and some of them will kick out neutrons. So you will get a photon from some other interaction and then something kicks out a neutron. So you will get this interaction even from cosmic rays. High energy, 
particles and cosmic rays will kick out neutrons. So there is an irreducible background when looking at this double flash of light with a characteristic time in between. But they were able to then estimate when the reactor turns on, the only new radiation coming into this detector is the neutrino. There's nothing else. You know, you haven't changed the cosmic background. That doesn't change, right? And the reactor is 11 meters from uh, the, I'm sorry, the detector is 11 meters from the reactor. So there's a lot of dirt around it. So no other, of course, nuclear reactors emit a lot of neutrons, but they are shielded. So the detector was shielded from everything else that's coming out of that, that, that nuclear reactor except the neutrinos. And the reason is that they were then able, by counting the number of neutrinos, and they know how many because they knew the radioactive decay chain, they knew how many, uh, you know, which uh, uh, isotopes are decaying, they know the number of decays, and so they were able to estimate how many neutrinos should be coming out of the reactor. What they did not know is the fact is the interaction strength, since these are only weak, only weakly interacting. But because they knew the number of neutrinos, they were able to then estimate the interaction, the interaction strength. And they estimated that the cross section is 10 to the minus 43 centimeters square per nucleon, where here the interaction is, is primarily, of course, on protons, but uh, um, they averaged it out on neutrons and protons. So uh, I don't know how many people are familiar. We use this word cross section a lot. It is a number that allows us to calculate the strength of an interaction. And so the way we use it is if you want to calculate the neutrino mean free path, you would, uh, you would basically, uh, the mean free path of a neutrino in, in, in uh, centimeters in this case, would be the cross section, which has units of centimeter square times the number of nucleus, nucleons per centimeter cubed. That will give you a number that's a centimeter. And that's how you use the cross section to calculate the mean free path. The mean free path is, of course, the path that a particle will travel through before one over e, the exponential, uh, uh, will, uh, uh, will interact. So what is the mean free path of a neutrino in lead? There's a link in my talk to the table of atomic and nuclear properties, um, but I'm going to leave people time to work on this. So first of all, what is the density of lead? You know, you're on your computers. You can pull it up on Wikipedia. You need to find out what the density of lead is, and then you need to find out how many nuclei in grams per centimeter cube. And then, and this is a question all of you should know how to answer, how many nucleons are there in one gram of material? It is a... Yeah, someone is answering. Yeah, so this is uh, in who answered, this is 11.34 density. Okay, that's the density of lead. All right, so how many, how many, so that's uh, 11.34 grams per centimeter cubed. Of course, you can look at my slides, but what is the number that tells you how many nucleons there are in one gram of material? Remember the cross section is 10 to the 43 centimeters squared per nucleon. Do we have a volunteer? Do we have a volunteer? <laughs> 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 one mole. What is one mole? And please don't look at the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. I mean, we're here to, to take the time to really go through this in, in a bit more detail. Hey, guys, this is very important for cross-section. So I, people who are going to go into particle physics, I think this is the basics. Barry, thank you very much for this exercise. Yeah. It is, it is a fundamental number in particle physics. And it chemistry is chemistry as well. <laughs> in, in every in, in all yeah. in chemistry as well, and it's yeah. uh, it's named after a, a scientist, uh, and it starts with a capital A. 
So we have George that gave oh, us. Oh, George, George, George Zimba. Have, George, yes. So, what is the name? How do we call this number? There's a particular name for it. Uh, sorry, Avocado's number. Avocado Thank number. you. Avocado and number. Great. We have several answers. Guys, you know this, right? It, 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 you just need to know that you know this. Okay, so there's Avogadro's number. Great. So we now have the density of lead and we have Avogadro's number. Can somebody tell me what is Avogadro's number translates into number of nucleons, which is the sum of protons and neutrons per gram. And what is that number? Somebody to write it. I can't see the chat, but you can write it in the chat or speak out. There's nothing yet. <laughs> hey, George, you have it in the chat. Could you just... in the avocado? Yeah. The number? Yeah. Can you explain? Ten to minus one. We have two people are answering. So yeah, what what is what is the value of Avogadro's number? Please, sir, may I take this in the chat? Ten to ten to twenty three. Think. Yeah. Okay, six times ten to the twenty three. So let's put all the numbers together. And I, I see both people here. So now let's calculate the neutrino mean free path from lead. It is one divided by this cross section, which is per nucleon. So it is, uh, so this is the key whenever doing any of your physics homework. And all of you engineering students also have to do this homework. Units always have to work out. If you don't know the answer, let, Question. Use the units to tell you how to get the answer. So 10 to the minus 43 centimeters per nucleon. Yeah. Please. Go ahead, go ahead. I can't hear you very well. You're breaking up. Please, sir, can you, can you, can you repeat the question? Yes. So the question was, what is the neutrino mean free path, which is the, 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 the mean free path is the distance that the neutrino will travel in lead before it interacts, okay? And that is calculated by taking the cross section in 10 to the minus 43 centimeters square per nucleon times the number of nucleons per centimeter cubed in lead. So the way we answer this, you guys told me it's 11.34 gram per centimeter cubed. I put 11.4 here. This is Avogadro's number. So 10 to the minus 43 centimeter squared times 11.4 grams per centimeter cubed times Avogadro's number six times 10 to the 23 nucleons per gram. And then I translate it all into meters. And this is 1.5 times 10 to the 16 meters, right? So then my next question, and it's something you can look up online, is how many light years is this? So light year is the distance that light travels in one year. Does it, Anybody remember the speed of light? What's the speed of light? Yes, of course. <laughs> Three times 10 to the 8. Three times 10 to the 8. <laughs> okay. So, what is a light year? All right. So, I am going to, I'm going to answer that. You can look it up. And you can check this number. It's one, I estimated 1 1.6 light years of lead or 100,000 times the distance from the earth to the sun. So if I fill up the distance from the earth to the sun with lead, <laughs> you will still not get that, uh, ha, you know, one over E in neutrinos would interact in it. As a, to compare, a proton has a mean free path of 10 centimeters in lead. This is why we lose lead shielding wherever we have uh, uh, any uh, ra you know, source of radioactivity or radiation that is producing a highly ionizing radiation like protons. Okay. So now people realize the challenge of detecting neutrinos is their interaction rate is very low, but there are so many neutrinos produced in a nuclear reactor that we can actually use that to study neutrinos or use neutrinos to study nuclear reactors. So we'll move on. And I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on reactor 
and reactor neutrinos because you know this is something that is um, almost every region on earth right now it has nuclear reactors and research reactors and uh, we are now starting to use neutrinos to actually study uh, nuclear reactors so this so there's some information in there for the nuclear physicists uh, that uh, would uh, practical information. So the, this is my next exercise. The following table shows the breakdown of energy release per fission from U-235. So remember that in a nuclear reactor, the chain reactor, chain reaction is in, a neutron is uh, absorbed by U, uh, the U-235, uranium-235, which then fissions and that starts the chain reactor that produces the energy that we use for our nuclear reactors. So there are uh, the energy reduced, the total energy produced uh, from fission products. So fission products, it's the energy reduced when the nuclei fission, right? You have, it breaks up, so there's energy released, that's the binding energy of the parent nucleus. You have some energy released because of course you fission into uh, two nuclei with lower energy states, that's 175. Uh, mega electron volts from one uranium-235 fission. There are neutrons that are also produced from the uh, fission and from the radioactive decays of the subsequent per, uh, daughters. There are photons produced from the fission and of course there are uh, betas from the beta decay and there are neutrinos. On average six neutrinos are produced in a single uh, decay chain one from one uranium-235 fission. And if you look, add up all the energies, you will find that 5% of a reactor's power comes from these average of six neutrinos. So now we're going to go to my next uh, exercise. How many neutrinos, given I have 210 mega electron volts are produced in, uh, from the fission of each uranium-235, and each uranium-235 fission produces six neutrinos. Right. So how many neutrinos are emitted per second from a gigawatt nuclear reactor? So the first exercise we have to do is we have to translate that into the number of fission. So, You need to translate from mega electron volts, since a single fission produces 210 mega electron volts, into gigawatt. So gigawatt is a unit of power. Power is joule, watt is joules per second. How many joules are in one mega electron volt? You can just go to go online, type joules, mega electron volts, and that will give you another fundamental conversion number in part that is used not just in particle physics, but in particle and nuclear physics. How many joules in one mega electron volt? You can write it on the chat as well. You can write it on the chat as well. Might be a slow internet. <laughs> Actually, is thinking still. <laughs> so I should depend on you then. No, no, no. But but these guys, you can just go to the web. Oh, and... I got it. You got yeah. it. George, George got it. Yeah, I, I, got it. I expect George to get it. George is doing almost about to get his PhD in nuclear physics. So it's okay. So next well, all right, George, and. And Abu Abida Hamza yeah. just got it too. Okay, he got it too. Excellent. So let's put all the numbers together. 
I, I put the chat up. So 10 a gigawatt is a billion joules per second. That's six times 10 to the 18 G, uh, giga electron volts per second. I divide that by 210 MeV per vision. I get three times 10 to 19 visions per second. Actually, uh, I had some of the students in a previous lecture check my numbers and I'm not, I'm okay within one order of magnitude, but the number is not exactly that. So you guys should check this, work it out. Um, and so you get about two times 10 to the 20 neutrinos per second because you have six neutrinos emitted in every fission and 220. <clears throat> right? And so the, they are emitted isotropically. So if I take the area of a sphere, so I move one kilometer away from the nuclear reactor, I will get 1.6 times 10 to the 13 per meter squared neutrinos per meter squared per second at one kilometer. Okay, so you work it out, check my math, tell me if I got it wrong. It is correct to it in one order of magnitude. <laughs> All right. So this is actually building up to uh, uh, new reactor neutrino experiments using the rate of neutrinos emitted from a reactor. So two times 10 to the 20 per second per gigawatt. And the average cross section of the inverse decay process, which is 10 to the minus 43 centimeters square per proton. What is the rate of neutrino interactions per day in a detector containing 100 tons of scintillator located one kilometer from a gigawatt reactor. All right, now this inverse beta decay process, which is the neutrinos interacting with the protons, it actually only happens on free protons. It would only happen on the hydrogen. So I have 100 tons of CH2. So what you'll need to do is to go and calculate how many protons, not in the carbon, but in the hydrogen, because, I mean, we did the exercise on lead, but now we are actually doing uh, real experimental calculations, okay? And real experimental calculations, we have to move from the concepts to actual practical implementations. In this practical implementation, the interaction of the neutrinos, usually uh, it doesn't happen on the carbon because carbon is a stable nuclei. So there's no, uh, you know, converting a proton into a neutron is not energetically favored, right? So that's why it's only, ha this interaction only happens on the proton, uh, on the proton in the hydrogen, because that's a free proton. We have to calculate number of hydrogen protons and 100 tons of scintillator, taking into account that the, the weight includes the carbon, and located one kilometer, so we know the number, the rate of neutrino from one kilometer, Put it all together. So the number of interactions per day is the flux, which we know from here, right? 1.6, 10 to the 13 per meter squared per second at one kilometer. You can work it out times the cross section, times the nucleons per gram. We already know that times how many nucleons there are in 100 tons. So the number of protons for total number of nucleons in 100 tons, and that's the number of protons in the hydrogen. That's the, that's the trick. Put it together, and you'll get that the number of reactions per day are 118. This is a gigawatt reactor. We're a kilometer away from a gigawatt reactor, and we have a 100 ton detector, and there we will get 100 neutrino interactions per day. This, right now, is the parameters that determine the neutrino experiments that are running at nuclear reactors. Why is this important? Is because nuclear reactors, when we started out, we were starting out in the 1950s with megawatt, 10 megawatt reactors. Today, most modern nuclear reactors are off the scale of multi gigawatts. Okay, we're up to 10 gigawatts, so several gigawatts per core. That means that we can actually measure the spectrum of neutrinos coming out of a nuclear reactor with a few tens, you know, about 100 tons by putting a detectors maybe a kilometer away. Now, a kilometer away from the reactor, the only thing that you will detect is the spectrum of neutrinos. And if we go back 
to the slide that I have over here, we actually have calculations of the spectrum of neutrinos coming from the burning of uranium-235, uranium-238, plutonium-239, and plutonium-241. These are the four isotopes that are primarily responsible for the neutrinos that we can detect. Now, there is a threshold for the interaction. I have to have enough energy to produce an electron for it, right? So that's why there's a threshold here about 1.8 mega electron volts. So we actually measure this part of the spectrum. And as you can see, this is neutrinos per, uh, the spectrum of neutrinos per fission. And the, the spectra are slightly different. So what is happening right now is that these neutrino detectors, we started out discovering neutrino detectors in reactors. Now we are using these neutrino detectors, which are very highly precise spectrometers. They measure the spectrum of neutrinos very, very accurately. You can do two things, okay? And this was the result that came out two or three years ago. You can now separate using very precise measurements of the, uh, uh, the energy spectrum of neutrinos, you can not only predict what power is burning independently, you can also independently determine what fraction of each of these four isotopes are pleasant. Now, we all know that plutonium-239 is the material that can be used to make bombs. And so what has happened right now is the precision of these neutrino experiments are not very different just the technology has advanced greatly, has, has become such as, uh, has really gotten to the point where you can drive your neutrino detector, 100 tons could be on top of a very large truck, measure the neutrino spectrum, and you will be able to tell when the reactor on, what power it is producing, in, and what isotope is burning. So there's a huge industry now that has started up in the US and Europe, use neutrino detectors to, uh, to actually um, monitor nuclear reactors, right? This is for non-proliferation, but also there has been a lot of interest in, among the uh, nuclear uh, in physics groups to predict these spectra very accurately. There are 6,000 branches that contribute to the, neutrino spectrum, to the neutrino spectrum from a reactor. Most of them are calculated. If I had more time, I have a lecture that's devoted to the uh, nuclear physics processes that contribute to the neutrino spectrum and how to calculate some of these uh, 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 decay chains. Some of it is measured from the beta decay spectrum, a lot of it has to be calculated, especially the ones that produce a very high energy neutrino. So there's, so we're not, we're now learning about uh, rare and forbidden nuclear decays that produce neutrinos. They're called forbidden, not because they're forbidden, but the transition is suppressed. So we're going back and now in adding a lot more detail to our predictions of the uh, chain reaction and the, the, the daughter product decays um, to the nuclear data table. And Brookhaven Lab actually hosts the nuclear data group, which is uh, a repository of all of the information on nuclear decays. Um, and it's one of, it's the biggest uh, data group in the US. All right, so we spend a lot of time on neutrinos and the discovery of neutrinos. And, um, I, I need to mention that Rhinus shared a 1995 Nobel uh, Prize for work on, uh, for the discovery of neutrinos, okay? Here's the first Nobel Prize that uh, has to do with the discovery of neutrinos. So next we'll move to neutrinos in nature. And, um, and here we have to go back to, again, his, history. How do we study neutrinos that are produced in, in nature by cosmic rays? And so I need to remind people about cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are charged particles that are that come from uh, you know you could, um, uh, interactions of high energy uh, charged particles that come from the sun uh, that are hitting our atmosphere and they interact in our atmosphere. 
So we, so there is actually uh, a, 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 an experiment called AMS that's trying to figure out what these charged part, initial charged particles hitting our atmosphere are. Uh, they're spec, you know, are they protons? Are they nuclei? They're usually either, pro, the, the heaviest of them are protons or iron nuclei, also high energy gamma rays, of course. And they, they produce an interaction that produces a chain of, uh, so they interact with the nitrogen in the air, and then they'll produce uh, the decays of, uh, you know, they'll produce particles, and we will then detect the particles on Earth. So much of the study of particle physics proceeded from studied of the different uh, masses and charges of the particles and cosmic rays. That's how we were able to discover the particles that are not the proton, the neutron, and the electron, which we would discover from radioactive decay, right? So we knew proton, neutron, and electron, but when we started looking at cosmic rays, they started finding out that there are other particles there. They are not proton, neutron, or electron. And that's where the particle physics was built up. And the way we did it is that they have something called a cloud chamber. So cloud chamber is a, a, a detector where the uh, gas is uh, super cooled, meaning that it's right at the point where uh, the transition between gas and liquid. So um, any energy, uh, you know, any, any charge that goes through, charged particle that goes through, that charged part becomes an, a nucleation point and a little droplet of liquid is formed around that charged particle. And what happens is you can then put it into electromagnet and you can look and see as that charged particle goes through, it forms these nucleation points. And these are, by the way, are studied in cloud formation, but uh, that's what the cloud chamber is for. And you can actually see the path of the particle in cosmic rays as it goes through the detectors. And if you put it in a magnetic field, it will bend. And the amount of bending is proportional to the charge and the momentum and the mass. So you can actually determine the, the, the mass and momentum most particles are either charge plus or minus one. Very few particles, alpha particles are charged too, but most particles have single charges. And so uh, under that assumption, you can actually look at the curvature of these particles and determine the mass. All right, so that's where a lot of the studies are charged. And sometimes you will actually see a charged particle come in and it will decay into other particles. And that's how we discovered some particles like the lambda, which contain strange quarks in them because they decayed into a proton and a pi meson. So in the studies of charged particles in 1936, um, he discovered a particle that had the mass between that of the electron and the proton. And, we now, and he called it the muon meson. This is Carl Anderson and Seth Nethermeyer, his graduate student. Uh, we now call these muons, but they thought it was a meson like the pi meson, which hopefully you've all heard about. And what happened is then they, they, this is the image. And so in the cloud chamber, they looked and they said, well, it behaves like an electron, but an electron coming into this cloud chamber will circle in the magnetic field. Whereas this thing, uh, a proton will have some charge, but it will be relatively stiff. Whereas this, this track was, was, was bending, so it had some mass that was smaller than that of the proton. Proton, I think, um, also hadronically showers. But it wasn't spiraling around like the electron. So they knew that it had a mass that was more than the electron, but it wasn't a proton, and it wasn't a pi meson. So they started studying this particle in detail. And in 1947, Cecil Powell took up photographic emulsion. This is very difficult to explain to students of the millennium generation who did not grow up taking Polaroid photos. <laughs> so, photographic, the old way were photos where it was not a charge, a charge couple device, it was not an electronic device. Um, and today when you print your photos out, you, you, you may actually print them on photographic paper, but it was a silver uh, emulsion. So it's a, it's a, uh, an emulsion, as you know, is like a, a, a liquid with, you know, a, a, a thick liquid, think of it as this, right? on plates. And when a charged particle would go through, 
it would actually cause a chemical interaction because energy is deposited and uh, this gray plate would then have, would turn black where the particle went through. This is how x-rays work, right? It, old x-rays would work that way it's because you would expose these photographic plates to photons and any energy deposition causes a chemical reaction and made it opaque instead of silver in color. And so they were able to image these charged particles and they see here the pi meson come in and then the big characteristic of this muon compared to protons, protons will, will travel short distances, right? Because they, they actually interact a lot. <laughs> Whereas this muon was traveling for very long distances and it was bending, but it wasn't bending as much as an electron. And so they didn't understand this. They said, okay, this is a different type of particle. It's different, a different type of signature in our detectors. They also found that the same particle is produced when there's a, a, another particle that comes in, which we now know is a pi meson. And then there's a kink here. You see where this kink is? So particle comes, decays into a, what they call the muon now, and then there's this kink over here. Law of conservation of proton and energy means that momentum has to be conserved around this point. You cannot have this kink. There's, so, that, so then they, they said, well, this pion is producing a muon. There's again, missing energy, missing momentum. So that missing momentum is carried away by a neutrino. So, they, so this, we discovered a muon, we discovered that pi mesons will decay into muons and neutrinos. Neutrons decay into protons, electrons, and neutrinos, right? So this is the next chapter. So there are neutrinos in cosmic rays, and they're coming from this interaction. And so our next step in studying neutrinos is to actually discover these naturally produced neutrinos. And so Fred Rhinus, who also, you know, Fred, the same Fred Rhinus who had discovered neutrinos from nuclear reactors and studied their properties, proposed that what we are going to do is to try and detect the neutrinos from cosmic ray interactions. So protons or iron, something comes in, we produce pions, and the pions decay into muons and neutrinos. And those neutrinos that are, dis as he called them muon neutrinos because they're produced in association with a muon, okay? They, you know, the earth will stop all the charged particles. The only thing that will penetrate, and, and we knew that. We knew that because we knew the cross-section of neutrinos, we knew the mean free path of neutrinos. So that's the only charged particle, it, sorry, that's the only particle from this interaction that will make it through the earth. And so he said, if I put a detector very deep in the earth, the only thing that can interact, I can detect the interaction, uh, the neutrinos are coming in, interacting. And since this is a neutrino produced in association with the pion, the assumption was that it will produce muons. The muons that are coming from the cosmic ray cannot penetrate through the earth. They will be stopped. If I see muons deep in the earth, then it can only come from the interaction of neutrinos because they're the only particle with cross section that will enable it to penetrate. And so where do I go to put a detector deep in the earth? And so this is, uh, this is a, a, a great experiment. And so this happened simultaneously both in India and in South Africa. And this was the first particle physics experiment, I think in, 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 in the African continent. This is the Case Western Institute South Africa neutrino detector experiment called CW SAN. And it was looking for signals of muons deep in the earth. And deep, you know, it turns out that South Africa has some of the deepest mines in, uh, in, uh, on earth, man-made mines. And so let's go down a gold mine, a gold mine at three and a half kilometers deep. No, no muons from the, from, in, from the atmosphere are going to make it down there. And I'm going to try and detect a muon. Now, only the very, you know, some muons will come from, uh, and what he was looking for were muons that were produced 
in the you know in the earth if a muon comes from above then maybe some of the highest energy muons are would penetrate that deep you're still not you're not at the center of the earth you're only three and a half kilometers in so some atmospheric muons make it through but they tend to come in from the top if i have a muon coming from this direction from here to here there's no way it is not coming from the atmosphere it is it originates somewhere in the earth so what they did is they put scintillator scintillator bars so these are bars of plastic material that produce light when a charged a particle goes through you detect the light using the ubiquitous photomultiplier tubes this is a picture of the experiment so there's scintillator bars this is uh, a drift they call them drift these uh, hallways in the mine and you instrument the side the walls with the scintillator bars and photomultiplier tubes and if a muon comes from the top, you will only get uh, one side hit. But if a muon comes from the side, not pointing to the upper atmosphere where the interactions are happening, that means it comes from an interaction in the earth and that is tagging the neutrinos through the, the, the lepton they produce. So in this case, we are, there are neutrinos that were produced from the decay of pion. So it's pion gives muon plus neutrino. So when that neutrino interacts, the assumption was it will produce a muon. And this is the signal. So these are the, it's a oscilloscope trace from four bars on one side and four bars in front of them. And here is a coincidence signal where something hits the second and bottom, one, two, three, one, two, three, and it's coincidence on both sides, both the walls, in front of each other. So this is a downward going muon, which only hit one, two, three, or oh, four. I think they have four, yes. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And this is a muon when it goes through here and then goes through there, you get them in time. This is a muon that is coming through the side, a horizontal muon. And so these muons could only come from the interaction of neutrinos. Neutrinos are neutral. We, don't, we only detect them through the interaction. And here's the discovery of atmospheric neutrinos. Okay. So we now know about neutrinos from reactors, which were anti-neutrinos, and they produce positrons. And now we have uh, neutrinos in the atmosphere, which produce muons. And so, the question was, you know, what's going, the reason that we knew that this would produce muons was a, a key experiment in particle physics uh, where we, hit, we discovered that neutrinos that are produced in association with an electron, let's say, or positron from beta decay, when they interact, actually produce electrons. And neutrinos that are produced in association uh, with a, a muon from pion decay, when they interact, produce muons. Why is that? Okay, they can't be the same type of neutrinos. And to prove that uh, was a, 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 another Nobel Prize winning experiment which happened at Brookhaven Lab. And here we use particle accelerators. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about, so the, the first attempt was to, at CERN, I believe, where they wanted to use particle accelerators to model the interaction in the atmosphere. So in the atmosphere, we have proton or iron. It hits an, a nitrogen. Uh, nucleus and you produce pions from the in energy of the interaction and the breakup of the nitrogen nucleus. And those pions then decay to muons and neutrinos. Well, I produce protons in an accelerator. I can use those protons, high energy protons produced in an accelerator, just like high energy cosmic rays. You know, we'll give them a target to hit, some nuclei to hit. High mesons are produced from the breakup of that nucleus, from the energy from the breakup of that nucleus, those pi mesons will then decay into a muon and a neutrino. And just as with the atmosphere, we have to shield, we have to make sure that none of these muons make it through, only the neutrinos can penetrate this far. So we put an absorber and then we put a detector and we look for neutrino interactions. And in this particular case, I can actually see that nothing is coming into the detector and then something happens 
and the particle is produced, and I will study these neutrino interactions. What type of particle do they produce? Do they produce an electron or do they produce a muon? Right? So this was the 1960s. Now, this technique is using most particle, ex most discoveries, the discovery of the bottom quark, the discovery of the charm quark, all happen using what we call fixed target experiments which is protons hitting a target and producing particles for us to study. Now, this is the experiment. So the uh, alternating gradient synchrotron at Brookhaven Lab produced uh, accelerated protons to an energy of 28 giga electron volts at 28 times the rest mass of a proton. And they put a target in a tar it could be a piece of graphite or a piece of beryllium. That's usually what the targets are. Tungsten. I think in this case it was tungsten. Um, and the breakup of the nuclei in that target produced pi mesons. And, and those pi mesons will travel and then decay just as they do in cosmic rays into muons and neutrinos. They put a lot of shielding around the detector, so none of these muons or the pi mesons that decayed or other neutrons produced. Everything is shielded. Only thing that can penetrate through that shield is the neutrino because of the cross section. And then the, ch the detector in this case was not a scintillator. It was a spark chamber. And the way the spark chamber works is you have uh, two large capacitive plates with very high voltage. Okay, So there's a very high voltage and the two plates are very close together. Um, any um, charge deposited, uh, ionization of the gas between the plates produced by a charged particle cause a breakdown and there's a spark. Right where that ionization is, there's an electrical breakdown and a spark. Okay. These are fun, but very dangerous. <laughs> and then you can photograph it. So they had, they had people standing there and, you know, turn the beam on, beam hits the target, take picture, picture, picture. And this is a photograph of the sparks. And so this is the first time you will actually see that nothing, there's nothing here. And then suddenly an invisible particle interacts and it produces your long muon track. Now, the, 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 the muon energy and sometimes it produces something else. Usually this is a proton, actually. It doesn't travel very far. Only the muon travels very far, and the distance it travels in your detector before it stops is usually proportional to the energy of the, the momentum of the, of the muon. So they were able to count how many interactions happened, how many of them produced muons, because they look for this vertex. We call this a vertex, where a particle decays into several particles, we call it the vertex, because two tracks come and join in here. And they were able to count. So this is, this is the data. There's no <laughs> computers yet. Um, and so some of these muons will stop. So they were able to count that we have 49 muons with less than 300 mega electron volts per centimeter squared momentum. If the muon leaves the detector, then I have a minimum, it's a minimum, 300 or 400, that's if it, if it starts from here to here, that's minimum 400. So they were able to put some, uh, uh, they were able to count and get some idea of the energy, depending on how, the length of the track. Exiting muons, you don't know the total energy, but you know the minimum uh, momentum. And so they counted, and then again, you can turn the beam on and off, and then you don't see this. If the beam is off, you'll see cosmic rays. When the beam is on and the beam comes, it, it's very precisely timed because of the RF nature. So you know that it's hitting the target to within a few nanoseconds because that's, that's how the accelerator works. Right? It's a accelerating current, it's a, a radio frequency cavity and they determine this timing. And so you can very precisely look at the time of the signatures and know that only when the beam is on do you get these interactions. So Zero neutrinos again, just like with the reactors, except here I know exactly the time when the proton beam hit the target. So I know exactly the time of, uh, and I can 
and can make know that this interaction only happened when a proton beam hit the target. So they looked at these neutrinos and they found that the vast majority of them, so most of the signals with vertices, have these long muon tracks. So the neutrinos produced in association with the muon are, are when they interact, produce a muon. Here's a pion decays to a muon and a neutrino. That neutrino primarily, when it interacts, produces a muon. There are some events that produced a shower, called six events. Okay. And so 34 interactions have muons in them, six didn't, and they said, well, those are background. But since the majority of them produce muons, they decided that neutrinos come in different types. The ones that are produce a positron, they come from the radioactive decays, they are an associate, associated with an electron, those anti-neutrinos, when they interact, produce that positron that gave us the signal reactor neutrinos. And if they come from muon decays, it has to be a different type of neutrino that is associated with the muon. All right. So, all right, so this got another Nobel Prize. <laughs> We're only up to two now. We have two more to go, which will probably be the subject of the next lecture. So I'll stop here, but I have an exercise here, but I will stop and take questions before we go to our exercise. Yeah, very good. So do we have more questions? Uh, I just wanted to find out, like, um, since the neutrino, neutrino um, really is said to really inter to, 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 to interact with anything, <clears throat> I wanted to find out how, many, how, how long did it take to get the, 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 the 40, 40 um, reactive events that the, <clears throat> this experiment got? Oh, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I don't know, but my guess is a few months. So, um, uh, because I don't know what the, this is actually related to our exercise, what the, what the, uh, the current they were running is, what the power they were running at. Um, it was probably, the beam was probably, I guess, to the 1960s, tens of kilowatts. I don't know. It's an excellent question. I will actually look it up. I have, you know, we, we actually had a, cel a 50th celebration for this experiment at Brookhaven. And uh, um, one of the graduate students, females, showed up and he was telling us what it was like being a graduate student in this experiment. And so the way, so here's the spark chamber with the muon tracks. And the way they would record this data is they would actually take pictures. They're standing there, there's a camera there that is triggered by the proton beam. So there's a camera, there's a signal from the accelerator that says, uh, beam on target, it triggers the camera, it takes a picture, right? The, the spark chambers were not hooked up to very smart electronics like we have right now. They were just sitting there and taking a picture. And so he told us that one night the camera failed. And so they had beam and, then, you know, it's very expensive running these accelerators, but the camera didn't work. So what they got is they got a, a tape recorder a voice recorder. This is the 1960s. Right? There's no iPad, uh, no, no iPod. <laughs> so they, 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 and then they sat down, the, the graduate students on shift, and visually described what they were seeing. So <laughs> every time they would see the beam would hit, they would, and the spark chambers, because it's an electrical breakdown, you can hear it. I mean, I've, been, I've, I've worked with this part chamber before. You can actually hear this. I believe there's one at CERN. You can hear it when, uh, when, when it breaks down. It's quite loud, you know, it's electrical breakdown. So they sat there on the recorder all night and they would be, oh my, that's a very long one. It went from this part of the detector to that part of the detector. That was the, I don't know if that data is included in the 40, but this is what happens when your detector breaks down. And that's what they had to do. So that was just a, a side story. But it's a very good question. My guess it's a few months to get 40, 40 events because uh, the, the, it was low power at that point. So let's do an exercise. Uh, uh, Saeed has a question. 
Oh, he has his hands raised. Thank yes, you. I do. Oh, thank you very much. Could you please go to the very beginning of the of the slide? I, there is a question I want to ask from the right of the slide. Uh, which um, one? That's actually the part. That, this one. The the first exercise. The oh, first the very, exercise to be precise. The first exercise on on reactor. Yeah, the, the very first exercise. Okay. Yes. That, yes. Uh, for the late, that was for the late. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I want to confirm some things. I actually seem confused a bit. Mm. I believe in a let's say in quantum chemistry or probably chemistry. When we talk about number of particles, when we, when we are talking in terms of Avogadro's number, I believe we are talking about. I don't know if I'm mistaken. So now, like this statement, number of nucleons, because number of nucleons, I believe, is the same thing as mass number. So Avogadro's number tells you. Um, Hello. So yeah, I think you're breaking up. Uh, right. Do you get my question, please? Uh, could, could you repeat the question? Because I think you, you, you broke up. Yeah, my question is, uh, I, have, I have something I want to confirm. As it does a statement written here and the answer given. I believe number of nucleons is the same thing as a mass number, right? The number, yeah, the mass number is yes, that yeah. is right. So I'll, okay, yeah. So I was of the I'm of the opinion that if what is actually being what is actually meant here is actually the Avogadro's number, shouldn't it be number of molecules instead of number of nucleons? But Avogadro's number is really the uh, um, the. Um, number it, it's the mass number it's the atomic mass in grams right that's what it is so the atomic mass is the number of neutrons plus the number of protons yeah right could you just come in with the last statement number of neutrons plus the number of protons yes that's what the that's what an atomic mass is so uranium 235 has a total of uh, I don't remember how many protons it has, but you can look it up. But the 235 refers to the total number of protons plus neutrons. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. So, Saeed, yes, you're right it. that in chemistry, they, they see that it's, a, yeah. uh, it's the molecule, right? But the molecule, um, you know, in some cases, is just the nucleus plus the electron cloud, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so in some cases, you could have two atoms that bind to make a molecule, or you can have just one atom, and but then the nucleus is in the center of that atom, and then you know, so so you can translate from Avogadro's number in chemistry to the same exact number in uh, nuclear physics or particle physics, where now we are talking about the 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 the, the nuclear the nucleus, whereas in chemistry people are talking about the whole atom or the whole molecule. So it's okay. basically the same number, right? Because yeah. if I understand your question correctly. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, very much. yeah, yeah. In chemistry, it's the yeah, it's the it's the atomic mass in grams. Okay. But sometimes when you see how it's used in physics, you understand it better because we use these numbers to actually design experiments. So it's, it's, that's how these fundamental numbers actually come into experimental design. How big a detector, what, what new, what, uh, how many protons do we need? And then that translates into data. Nice thing about neutrinos. <laughs> All right, so let's, any more questions? All right, so, so let's go. Another one. Oh, yeah, go so ahead. Can, okay, thank you. So I, um, I'm just wondering, in the production of uh, beta decay, the beta minus and the beta plus, yeah. is, there, is there conservation of mass? Yes, there's always conservation of mass and there's always conservation of, of energy. Uh, mass and energy are interchangeable. So uh, what happens is that the neutron 
mass. I mean, it's really a decay of a quark. <laughs> Right. So it's an up, when a neutron decays into a proton, it is really an up quark decaying into a down quark. And if they're both at rest, that difference in mass is what gives, is the energy that is shared between the electron. And now energy, so that difference in mass translates into energy. It's E equals MC squared. So the difference in the mass between an up quark and a down quark if they're both sitting at rest, is then converted into the energy and mass of an electron, right? Now remember, um, we don't know exactly what the masses of the quark are. We have, we're building a $2.6 billion uh, accelerator here at Brookhaven to try and understand uh, the quark content of the proton, what gives mass to the proton. We know what the mass of the proton is, but how much of that mass is the quark? We, we don't actually know, we have some idea. But, um, so basically, we do know the difference in mass between a proton and a neutron. And so you can look at that and see how much that is. Remember that an electron is 2000 times lighter than a proton. So that energy difference produces an electron which has, and whatever energies does not go into the producing the mass of the electron becomes the uh, kinetic energy of the electron and also gives energy to the neutrino whose mass is less than one electron volt. Okay, actually the question, uh, the second question I was about asking about that, I think you just talked about now. I want to believe that that experiment of beta decay beta minus or beta plus could actually be used in an antimetry. I don't know if I'm correct. Yes. Some, some, uh, it depends on which, on which radioactive decay it is. Some will produce beta particles, which produce antineutrinos. So the beta particle is an electron. The beta plus is a positron. And so in that case, a neutrino will be produced. And there are actually, there, this was a proposal by Carlo Rubia, which is not very practical, but one way that he said you can produce pure beams. So as you can tell from the, the, this, the start of my exercise, whenever we produce particles from accelerator, the challenge is that you, when you have a proton on target. So most accelerators are either electron accelerators or proton accelerators. So the proton accelerators produce primarily pions. And those pions decay 99% of the time to muons and muon neutrinos. And so neutrinos produced from accelerators tend to be of the muon type. It would be nice to produce a neutrino from an accelerator that is an electron type or an anti-electron type. And so Carlo Rubia had proposed that we'd actually select um, beta decaying radioactive nuclei we, all, we also know that we do accelerate heavy nuclei. This is what happens at the relativistic heavy ion collider and at the LHC, where to study you know, quark gluon plasma, uh, we accelerate heavy nuclei. And so the proposal was that we would select, there were certain uh, uh, high Q value radioactive decays. I don't know if you're a nuclear chemist, but that's, that's where it's coming from. Um, and accelerate these radio, these uh, decaying nuclei to produce accelerator beams of either electron neutrinos or electron antineutrinos from radioactive decay. Now, this is technically very, very challenging. <laughs> I'll let the accelerator physicists like Christine comment on the beta decay uh, uh, experiments that were proposed for, again, to study to produce beams of neutrinos. So um, I can study this, uh, but then I'm more on the engineering side. So yeah, well, <laughs> engineering a, an accelerator to accelerate radioactive nuclei is is, is it's extreme. Gonna cost a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna it, cost already with proton by comparison to electron, so this costs a lot to accelerate. So it's uh, uh, I mean at least three order of magnitude more. So imagine with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the heavy ion, so not sure. But then there are, there are a lot of uh, ex equivalent tests as well done for 
different activities like with the ganil and other type of accelerator. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're right. And so that's um, and yes, and so there are the neutrino. Some there are also uh, neutrino uh, uh, studies of neutrino uh, from um, where you have a very high rate, high radioactivity sources, the puries, of very dangerous, <laughs> but it has to be a, a, a very powerful radioactive source because you need the large number of neutrinos because of the low cross section that you just mentioned. So those are the two. Um, so there, those were the two. There were two. There were several experiments using very um, uh, high radioactivity sources uh, to study neutrinos from from beta decays, and uh, and then of course mo the modern beta beam concept. So I, I don't have time to go into those. <laughs> any more? Any more questions on on? Uh, I'll put a question maybe for the, the next session. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, point. yeah, no, I think Gargamel at CERN. Yeah. yeah. The Galax experiment used radioactive source and uh, looked at neutrinos. And, and maybe as well kind of application for the um, I mean, research factor, because in Africa, there could be potentially as well some interest for this type of physics on the research reactor existing. Yeah. I, there is actually at the end of my slides, there are, I do have uh, neutrino applications uh, uh, where I, I'm, I, I refer to it, you know, like the non, the, the research that you can do in reactors and more practical. Uh, but, um, all right. Very Any good. more questions? I, I have one more, one more question. Maybe it might be a bit naive, right? So if I'm not mistaken, like from previous slides, you said that a neutrino takes about 1.6 light years before it travels 1.6 light years before it decays. It right? interacts. It doesn't decay. It actually interacts. Oh, be yeah. Before yeah. before it before it interacts, and the distance the, the distance between the source <coughs> the source of um, the source of neutrinos in the in the, in the previous experiment and the um, and the What's what's the name of the 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 where where, where you have the capa the capacitors that spark? Oh, uh, the spark it? chamber. Yes. The spark yeah. chamber. Yes. Uh, that distance is much smaller than. Yeah, uh, and the neutrinos. the distance to the reactor. So the this is the mean free path of the neutrino. So if you know if you remember from uh, basic physics, the mean free path is basically the distance traveled before e to the minus one will interact. Right, so we, and so the way that, uh, so if you, if you take e to the minus the distance travel divided by the decay length, so the decay length is 10 to the 16, and you have a kilometer, for example, or a few tens of meters. So right now we're talking about a few tens of meters. Uh, yeah. You will find that a very, 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 very tiny fraction will interact. Oh, okay. But so the way you were able to do that is you have to produce a lot of neutrinos. Yeah. That is why it took a few months for only 40 interactions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's that's a very good question. That's how we translate these these numbers into actual experimental design. Is is uh, and it gives you the, the the challenge for neutrinos is that's why our detectors are usually hundreds of tons, and we're always from a source. So a reactor will give out ten to the twenty neutrinos per second. So if your decay length is ten to the nineteen meters and you're a kilometer away, but you have ten to the twenty neutrinos, you get yeah we get a hundred interactions and a hundred tons per day because of the large number but only tiny, tiny fraction actually are the ones interacting. Okay. It's all about cross-section. Yeah. It's all about the cross-section. Yeah, good exercise. And then we have the next uh, so exercise that, that uh, you will- Yeah, so the next exercise is an accelerator exercise. Mm. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, to produce neutrinos from accelerators, like we said, we use uh, a proton accelerator on a target 
uh, which could be gra gra graphite, carbon, beryllium, tungsten, tantalum, but carbon, beryllium, and tungsten are usually the most common ones. Uh, the reason is they can actually, you can actually put a lot of power in them and they will not melt <laughs> or blow up. Uh, so here's, this is a practical application. The main injector accelerator at Fermilab delivers 4.86. That's why it's a very strange number, times 10 to the 13, 120 GV protons in a 10 microsecond pulse every 1.33 seconds to the Numi neutrino beamline. What is the average power of the proton beam delivered in megawatts? Right. Okay. So, do, you, do you want to give some clue? Or some yes, clue? I'll, I'll work it. I'll work it out with you. So we have 120 giga electron volts. So we have to translate that giga electron volt. So a watt is joule per second, right? So we start with the unit of energy here is a giga electron volts, and we did that. It's in our exercise, right? We have. Uh, if we go back to the chat. So George had one joule is six times 10 to the 12 mega electron volts. Okay, or one megawatt hour <laughs> is 2.2, one megawatt is 2.2 times 10 to the 22 mega electron volts. So here we have, it's 120 giga electron volts per proton times 4 times 4.86 times 10 to the 13 protons. So you have to calculate the total energy of these 10 to the 13 protons in using one megawatt is 2.2 times 10 to the 22 mega electron volts. All right, now the protons come in a 10 microsecond pulse. As in real life, some information is important, some information will not be, but it the, if we want to use the average power, not the instantaneous power, we just need to know that this, these large number of protons come every 1.33 seconds. So we want energy. What's a power? What's a watt? Is in joules per second. So we want to know how much energy is on average is produced. How many joules per second are coming out of this proton beam? Let me, I'm going to go, I'll, I'll move along, but that, that's the idea. So here's how we do it. 120 GeV per proton. That's the energy of one proton. There are 10 to the 13 protons, uh, 4.86 10 to the 13 protons. And it's 1.6, 10 to the minus 10 joules per giga electron volts. And then of course I need to do, do, divide it, but it's every 1.33 seconds. And this is 700 kilowatts, right? This is the actual snapshot from the accelerator control when this happened. So 700 kilowatts was, is the most powerful neutrino beam currently operating. That is why I chose this number and I chose this number from the snapshot when the, uh, uh, the, proton, the proton pulse was produced. So here it is. This is the, you will see this from the accelerator control room. They broadcast this. The neutrinos of the main injector beam line has 48.6 e to 12 protons per second. The power 701 kilowatts. So maybe my two here round up error. All right. And these are other beam lines. But this is when this, uh, the 700 kilowatt, um, um, was achieved, and that was a great achievement a couple years ago. At that point, this is the highest power neutrino beam in the world, was when we got that pulse at Fermilab. I believe it was a couple years ago. But now, you know, when we talk about, so this is almost, so this, this target that I'm talking about, if we want to talk nuclear engineering, we can talk some nuclear engineering. I have an average power. If you want to translate it into instantaneous power, you use the 10 microseconds. Now let it, and for the nuclear engineers, I will let you translate that into instantaneous power. Right? We only use 1.3 seconds to do the average power. The instantaneous power is higher. So the instantaneous power 
on the graphite target. That graphite target for the NUMI beamline is 6.4 millimeters in diameter and a meter long. So for the engineers in the, in the audience, you can calculate the energy deposited in that graphite target which is rectangular in shape, it's 6.4 millimeters by 2.2 centimeters in height by a meter long. And you can calculate what energy deposition, and most of the energy is in the region from a few centimeters to like 20 centimeters, what we call shower max, in the graphite. And per pulse. So, we need, we work, the, there's a huge engineering challenge involved in keeping, in designing the targets for these very high power accelerators. And neutrinos are the ones that need the highest power. We need the most neutrinos, which means we need the highest power. The targets are very thin because we want all the pions not to be absorbed in the target. We want the pions to escape and decay to produce neutrinos. So now this is a challenge that nuclear engineers deal with all the time because graphite is a moderator material in reactor experiments. It's also the, the, the graphite and beryllium, and that is also the material that we use for our high power target. You can calculate, you know, uh, you can do your finite element analysis and look at the deformation of the target energy deposition in joules per centimeter cubed, and the increase in the temperature in the target, the shears and the stresses on the target. How do you support a meter long target that's only 6.4 millimeters wide? <laughs> that is being pounded every 1.3 seconds with kilowatts of beam. Do you cool it? Do you not cool it? How do you deliver cooling to it? Um, so this is, uh, and some of these challenges are, are shared in the design of nuclear reactors when you're designing the, the graphite uh, moderators for nuclear reactors. And a lot of our understanding of how these materials uh, survive uh, in this high radiation environment, because of course protons are highly ionizing radiation, comes from the studies of uh, radiation damage to materials uh, from nuclear reactors. And on the other hand, we feed back also from engineering these targets and studying the uh, radiation damage in our accelerators, we feed back to the nuclear uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, information on details on how materials uh, react under high radiation doses. So, there's a lot of back and forth, but that's where a lot of our engineering comes in from, is in designing not just the accelerators, but also designing the targetry for these neutrino beams, which is extremely challenging. Okay. Do, do, the, do the targets not deform uh, as you add, as you, as you subject them to the beam? Absolutely, they do. Absolutely, they do. And uh, it's, uh, um, you know, I could, I could spend a lot of time on the engineering of the neutrino, uh, the NUMI beamline and the NUMI target, because uh, that's part of the, I work uh, a little bit with the engineers involved in that. It does deform, um, but that's one of the reasons we use graphite. Yeah. Okay, so you can look at the coefficient of thermal expansion. There's something called the K-factor that looks at the coefficient of thermal expansion uh, and, uh, uh, and other uh, mechanical properties to find out which of these stars. So graphite, because of the layering, is a bit, um, you know, it, and beryllium both have uh, thermomechanical properties that, that um, um, allow them to withstand the stress from the temperature, uh, this very rapid temperature rise when the proton beam hits it. So that's why, and tungsten is the same way. So the reason that we use these materials are because of the thermomechanical properties of them and also the radiation damage. But we do design it. So when you're designing the mechanical support system, 
And of course, we cool the target. So there are two ways of cooling these targets. The NUMI target was water cooled, meaning that there was a water pipe that went over the graphite. The graphites were in, uh, in, in, in fins, uh, the top and bottom of the graphite that cooled it so that you know, it, would, it, it, it would not deform too much between pulses. Uh, modern neutrino beams uh, that we're designing today, we use helium. So flow high, high, uh, high rate, high, uh, high helium flow around the target to carry away the heat from the target. Mm -hmm. And to try and, and uh, reduce the deformation. So does the cooling happen on the surface of the target? Because what I'm thinking is that like you could. Yes, but uh, graphite and beryllium have both good thermal conductivity. So you cool the surface of the target and they're very thin, these targets. So you only cool the surface of the target, but because they have good thermal conductivity, a lot of the heat is conducted out of the core where most of the energy deposition is. So and, then and it won't be subjected to the thermal yeah, so, spaces that come from the, from the center. Yeah, yeah. So this is, I mean, uh, another big challenge that we have engineering wise uh, is that the, the targets tend to be surrounded by these, uh, what we call horns. They are magnetic focusing system, magnetic lenses. <laughs> so the horns themselves <laughs> are also getting hot from the spray of particles hitting them. Uh, it's just a magnetic lens. And uh, it, it has the shapes that you see here, double parabolic shape. But they're made out of very thin aluminum. And we go, uh, usually they operate at about 200 to 300 kiloamps in a few millimeters of aluminum. These are not superconducting magnets. To generate a very, you know, Tesla, Tesla magnetic fields to bend the particles. Yeah. So the, uh, there's a, the engineering challenges of these neutrino beams are huge. Okay, so this is my next exercise actually. But you probably uh, um, has to do with the, uh, how do the how we come up with the main parameters for a neutrino beam. This is a schematic of the new, uh, neutrino, the main injector beam line. I'll go through this one quickly. You guys can do it on their own. So what fraction of 6 GV pions? So pions from the NUMI target will decay to neutrinos before reaching the end of the evacuated NUMI decay pipe of 675 meters long. Pion rest mass on lifetime as 140 MeV and 26 nanoseconds. So the pions have a rest mass of 26 nanoseconds, but the energy that comes out on average is six giga electron volts. Now, part of ASP always includes um, running a FLUCA simulation, which is used both in nuclear and particle physics. And so this is one of the simplest things that you can simulate is you can simulate 120 giga electron volts on a beryllium target and look at the number of pi mesons coming out. Now we focus those pi mesons so they're traveling in a straight line and to allow them to decay, we have a, a volume so the pi mesons are focused in a magnetic field, they bend. We can pick whether we focus pi plus or pi minus by using the magnetic uh, elements here. And that's why we can pick whether if it's pi plus decaying, it produces a muon neutrino. If it's pi minus decaying, it's an anti-muon neutrino. But the challenge of these beam lines is that these pi mesons are high energy. Okay. And so I want the more decay, the more neutrinos, but they, they're high energy. So 26 nanoseconds and 100 and and 6 GV, this is, rel this is general relative, this is, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's special relativity, right? You have to calculate what the lifetime is of a 6 GV pion. It's not 26 nanoseconds. Does, that, does everybody remember their uh, special relativity? How do I translate a rest, the lifetime at rest, to a lifetime in decay, to the lifetime uh, uh, when it's not at rest. I'll go through that. So the pion lifetime is gamma. The gamma factor 
That's not gamma the photon, that's gamma the relativistic boost. The relativistic boost is given by the energy divided by the rest mass of the particle. So if the particle is at rest, it's 26 nanoseconds. The relativistic boost, the gamma, is 6 GV divided by the mass of the pion, which is 140 mega electron volt. That gives us the lifetime, the relativistic lifetime. This is a special relativity. Your lifetime is extended when you're traveling near the speed of light. It's given by this gamma factor. One time slows down. So what's the difference between that gamma factor and the one and the, the one that's equal to one over the square root of one minus? It's the same. It's the same. It's the same. Wow. It's the same. It's exactly the same. You can translate the one. If you put in the formulas for uh, uh, the energy, which is a p squared, p, p, a p, a p squared, c squared, plus m naught c squared, that's the, the total energy. This is the total energy of the particle, which is the kinetic energy plus the rest mass energy in, rel in, in special relativity. Uh, you will find out that one over square root of one plus beta squared, that gamma factor is also the total energy divided by the rest mass energy. Okay. Okay, that's your uh, special relativity exercise. So you put that in it and it's 1.1 microsecond. And the, uh, which means that the decay length is speed of light times the lifetime is 334 meters. That's, then I can, you take that decay length and I calculate the fraction that will decay. So the fraction that are left after decay length is e to the minus the distance traveled divided by the decay length, or the mean free path, both are the same. So the fraction that have decayed is one minus that. It's one minus the fraction that's left, right? And of course we have to include the probability that a pion decays into a muon and a muon neutrino, which is 99%. So you, you put in 675 meters is the length of the, this decay volume. After that, we have absorbers so mostly made out of iron that absorb any pions that haven't decayed, so they don't decay. And so if you look at that, you'll find out that this is, and we don't want any material in here because material would absorb the pions and they won't decay and produce neutrinos. So this decay pipe was 675 meters long. It was two meters in diameter and it had to be evacuated. And it had to be kept under vacuum. And 86% of the pions will decay in this lamp. So here's another engineering challenge. Pions that don't decay, they hit the walls of the decay pipe and heat them up. <laughs> okay. So you not only had to keep this evacuated, we eventually ended up filling it up with helium. Helium is, is very uh, low density. And so it didn't have much of an impact. There's not enough material in helium, but keeping it at point minus 10 to the minus three of an atmosphere in a volume this big was problematic. Uh, and so uh, we eventually put in helium at one atmosphere. What's the DK pipe made of? Uh, the pipe itself is made out of uh, stainless steel, iron. It has to be stainless steel because there's corrosion from where the, the, the particles actually hit. And this was actually a topic of discussion with the engineers. Stainless, a stainless steel pipe that big is, is not cheap. Yeah. And it had to be cooled because 50% of, uh, of the beam energy is actually only 5% of the energy deposited in the top. 50% of it is, are all of these particles interacting in the shielding and the K-pipe wall. So the, it was water cool. Okay. So, um, have I been going for two hours? Yes, um, maybe <laughs> I think, uh, <clears throat> I think, we're I think done. we should stop here. And, yeah, uh, no, this is, this is exactly where I was going to stop.
Yeah. Um, and I'll just, uh, so this, these were actually my slide, last slides. So this is where uh, there was only one thing I need to mention is the number of neutrinos, but we can, we, I can follow, I can do that next, next uh, this is, I will start from here in the next lecture. Uh, so here are neutrinos. We, we now know we have electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and they're part of the lepton family. Uh, neutrinos come from a lot of sources. You can get them from the Big Bang. There's 300 neutrinos per centimeter cubed. They're very cold left over from the Big Bang. Neutrinos from reactors. Neutrinos are produced by fusion in the sun. They're produced in supernova. They're produced in the atmosphere. They're produced by accelerators and they're produced from extra galactic sources. And so now we, knew, we are now using neutrinos to study the reactors, the Big Bang. We use neutrinos to study the sun and vice versa. We use neutrinos to study the dynamics of supernova. We, uh, uh, we use, I mean, accelerator and atmospheric neutrinos are primarily used to study the neutrinos themselves, but we can also use very high energy, this is beta electron world neutrinos, to study the processes that are happening in the black holes at the center of galaxies, which are producing very high energy accelerators. Only the neutrinos make it, right? And in my presentation, there's a link to all the different types of experiments that are studying these different types of neutrinos. So Ice Cube is trying to understand what goes on in a black hole at the center of the galaxy by studying the neutrinos, the very high energy neutrinos. It is a kilometer cubed of, in, of, of ice in the South Pole that has been instrumented with photomultiplier tube and the ice is used as a scintillator. You can click on these links. Dia Bay is our modern reactor neutrino experiment and I'll mention more of that later. But you can see, and Boroxino is the, is the experiment that actually has detected neutrinos from the burning of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in the sun. So when we look at the light from the sun, we're only seeing the light from the, the processes happening at the surface of the sun. But we're burning heavy elements inside the sun. The light does not get out, only the neutrinos do. And so by, by measuring those neutrinos, I can actually look at what is going on inside the sun. Same with supernova. And uh, just uh, the question that always comes out, is neutrinos uh, dark matter? No, they're not. They are only 0.5% of the matter in the matter energy in the in the universe. And this is actually the topic of my next lecture, so I am done. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, that was really impressive, Mary. Um, I learned a lot myself. Um, so I suggest that we stop here. I will suggest to everybody, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the students uh, or postdoc who I uh, 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 connected to go through the exercises again that my Mary uh, has uh, demonstrated. I think they are very useful, at least even to refresh your memory on these things. Uh, so to go through them again for next week's uh, lecture or just to refresh yourself. Um, so we'll have Mary again uh, next week. Uh, I think some of you have been to ASP, you have already encountered her at, at, at the ASP. Uh, she and I have been working here at BNL very hard to get uh, ASP students uh, to BNL and to other places in the U.S. So um, she's uh, so feel free to contact her as well directly if you need anything specifically related to the lecture and so forth. Uh, but uh, let's come back next week. And Mary, thank you again very much. Oh, thank you guys. Uh, yeah, we, we look we forward. Had a great to audience. Yeah, we look forward to having you again uh, next week. Yeah, so hold off your question. Think about, think about uh, all the things that you've heard now. If other questions come up, other points that you want to clarify, or either contact Mary or you know, come back next week to, for a lively discussion. All right, so let's stop there. Thank you very much. Christine, you have anything to say or should we go? No, you said it. So it's uh, really like a very good talk. And then we are expecting, I think, even more interesting things about neutrino next time, the little neutron. 
All right. So on that note, uh, thanks everybody. Yeah, uh, Rashid, thank you. Mary, we did have some senior guys also connected. I, I failed to mention them, but I'll mention them next time. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.